You're listening to the Tom Hartman Program. Should we put the gambling regulators in charge of our economy? Since Ronald Reagan, Phil Graham, and other Republicans deregulated our banks, hedge funds, well, not just the Republicans, actually, Bill Clinton played a big role in this, and have taken a hands-off approach to the Fed, three senators have come up with a unique idea. How about instead of banking regulators looking over their affairs, we turn to the gambling regulators in the states. Senators Cantwell of Washington, Wyden of Oregon, and Sanders of Vermont have made the presumably tongue-in-cheek proposal to show how absurd it is that we've let the libertarian ideal of predatory monopoly capitalism grow so out of control. Meanwhile, as the stock market rises, we hemorrhage jobs. To put some of this into perspective, economist Dean Baker joins us. Dean is the uh, co-executive director of the Center for Economic Policy Research. CEPR.org is the website. Uh, Dean, welcome back to our program. Thanks for having me on. Uh, I'm, I'm, I've, I've been re- reading a number of your articles recently, and, and uh, apropos just broadly of what's going on with the economy, how do we address uh, successfully, both in an educational context and also, frankly, from a policy point of view, the fact that as corporations, as uh, worker productivity is going up, corporate profits are going up, the stock market is going up, and yet just in the last week, three major corporations in America have have announced multi-thousand person layoffs, that that the stock market is not an indicator of the fiscal health of the nation, although it, it, it does reflect some things, and that the average American worker has been taking it on the chin for 30 years. Well, one might have hoped that we'd see a little different story coming out of this downturn. Now, basically, at this point, we really aren't out of the downturn. I mean, that's one of the striking things. You have all these people talking about recovery, and the economy is growing, but the unemployment rate continues to rise, or probably continue to rise well into 2010. Hopefully, you know, we'll stop before the end of the year and turn around, but it, it doesn't look good. The immediate future does not look good for workers. The, you know, more important question, obviously we care about the immediate, people are living in the immediate, but, you know, the more important question is once we get back on a growth path, which hopefully won't be too far down the road, whether we start to see more gains going back to ordinary workers. And I'm worried what we're seeing now is not a good sign. In particular, I'm looking at Wall Street where, you know, they more than anyone have recovered, and it's exactly business as usual, and it's just kind of amazing. You know, here these guys, you know, wrecked their own firms, ran to the Treasury, we need money, we need money, or, you know, we're all dead. We gave them the money, and now they're they're just throwing it around, they're having big parties, giving out multi-million dollar bonuses, and they're saying, you know, what's the problem? What's wrong with you people? Yeah. Arguably, the only reason the Goldman Sachs is still around is because they bought insurance on their bets through AIG. We bailed out AIG, AIG paid off the bets to, to Goldman, Goldman made out well, and now we see, this is today's Financial Times, the uh, front page of today's Financial Times, article by Greg Farrell in New York. Uh, Goldman Sachs pays its employees more than other financial groups because its employees are more productive, declared Lloyd Blank, Blankfein, Goldman chief executive. Uh, Goldman is likely to pay out an average $650,000 in compensation to each of its 30,000 employees, matching a record set, its record set in 2007. This is nuts. You know, it's it's like you know somebody's somebody makes something on an assembly line in Detroit, and they're actually making something for the U.S. economy. They're converting raw, you know, they're converting raw steel into a into a car that that produces arguably some economic benefit, and and does so over time. The guys at at uh, Goldman Sachs are just shuffling money and and paper around and 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 producing nothing that I can see of value. What am I missing here? You aren't missing much. I mean, if anything, you've understated the extent to which Goldman's been dependent on taxpayers' largesse, because in addition to the money that they got from the government through AIG, that was $13 billion, by the way. That's real money, even here in Washington. They also borrowed, I think it was $28 billion with a guarantee from the FDIC. So that means, you know, in effect, it had the full credit and backing of the U.S. government. Naturally, that means you pay a much lower interest rate. In addition, they got, we don't know how much, but they got a substantial amount of money through the Fed's special lending windows, which, again, is a below market rate. I mean, we all yeah. wish we could go to the Fed and have them lend us money at near zero interest, and then we could go be like Goldman and speculate on oil futures, and if it turns out well, we're rich, and if it turns out poorly, we run back to the government and tell them we need more money. Yeah. Yeah, this is this is a a, fun, a, a, a badly broken system, and and I, I'm I'm guessing that we're in agreement that a, a large part of the solution is to bring back some transparency to the banks, uh, reinstate Glass Steagall, uh, audit the Fed. 
<laughs> well, the Fed, you, you know, you've been, you, you, the segment just before I came on, you are talking about, I, I didn't hear about this, but they're talking about turning over regulation to gambling commissioners. and Yeah, this was a press release from these three senators. So. Yeah, yeah I, I'd miss that, but it's actually, gambling's a, a, the appropriate analogy here, and what, what I, one of the things I've worked on, and there's actually growing interest in this, is the tax on financial transactions, a very modest tax, you yes. know, so... So if you had tax, the rate they have in England, 0.25%, a quarter of 1% on a stock trade. And if you had, a, say, just something like one one hundredth, two one hundredths of a percent on trading options, futures, credit default swaps, these other instruments that people speculate in, raise a ton of money. And it would have almost no effect on those of us who are using these for their normal purposes. You know, you buy stock for your retirement or, you're, you know, a farmer is hedging their, their wheat crop. Right. It, you know, it would be a trivial amount of money. But for those people who are, in effect, gambling, it would be a lot of money. Right. And that's why gambling's the analogy here. If you want to gamble in Las Vegas, gamble in Atlantic City, obviously it's legal. People do it. But they pay a tax. Right. And we should have the same attitude. If you're going to gamble with credit default swaps, go ahead, but we're going to tax you. Well, and in fact, we had a stat tax here in the United States up until, what, 67? 64, that's 64. right. 64, yeah. That's right. And, uh, and it was used to pay for the Security and Exchange Commission, but it was starting to generate so much more profit uh, than the, the, or so much more revenue than the SEC needed that the, the Congress, or the, at least this was the official rationale, as I recall, Congress said, uh, uh, we don't need that tax anymore because, you know, it's, it's just generating way too much money. Um, I would argue that it was probably the lobbying of the bankers, but um, I'm, I'm curious, uh, the, it, this is here's an article on the front page of uh, again from today's Financial Times. Brazil's fin- finance mis- minister has sparked speculation that the government will introduce further capital controls. Um, as I'm sure you're aware, we're talking with Dean Baker, economist and co-executive director of the Center for Economic Policy Research in Washington D.C. CEPR.org. Um, last month, Brazil introduced a two percent tax, I and mean, you're talking about two tenths of one percent or point two five. This is a two percent tax on foreign portfolio investments to try to stop the, their, their currency, the real, from exploding in value because there was all this money flooding into their country as, as both a, a healthy economy and as a safe haven. And it doesn't seem to be working. It wasn't a, apparently a high enough tax, and they're talking about even raising it higher. Um, I'm wondering what your thoughts are, on, fr- uh, frankly, on the attempts to use monetary policy to control what might more... At, more correctly be done with either trade policy or, in this case, uh, uh, banking regulation? Well, monetary policy is an important tool, but you want to, you have to be careful. So uh, if, if Brazil were to try to uh, prevent its currency from rising, presumably what they'd want to do is cut their interest rates, which may be a good thing to do. I don't know enough about the current state of Brazil's economy as to know whether that would be a good solution. But you know, it's it's a blunt instrument. So, you know, it may not be something, you know, in other words, I, I could very well believe that Brazil doesn't want to lower its interest rates, but at the same time, it doesn't want to see its currency continue to rise in value. One, because in the short term, that will hurt its trade position. In the longer term, you set up a situation where it's almost certainly going to be reversed. I mean, if its, tra- if its currency price gets out of line, just as with the dollar, right. at some point it's going to fall, and that, that could lead to a very unpleasant experience. We, do, we have a, about a half a minute here, uh, Dean. Um, uh, Tim Geithner this morning said in Japan he supports a stronger dollar, yet everybody seems to be saying we need a weaker dollar to enhance our trade position in the world. Your thoughts? Well, we definitely need a weaker dollar, and I hope that's just rhetoric, but it would be even better if he didn't say it, because ultimately we're going to recover from this by increasing our, our exports, our, our improving our trade position, and that means a, a lower dollar. There is no other way to seriously talk about that. If we want to get back towards balanced trade, we have or, to have a much lower dollar. Or, in particular, a stronger yuan. The, that's right. The Chinese well, that's, currency. That's a big part of the story. We need the Chinese currency really has to rise against the yeah, dollar. Because they're they're manipulating basically their currency. Dean Baker, CEPR.org, the website. Dean, always great having you on. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for dropping by. Good talking with you.